Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to get started in about five minutes. But in the meantime, if you'd like to go ahead and share where you're coming from tonight, feel free to drop, drop that in the chat. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us, whether you're coming uh, from South Philadelphia or all the way in British Columbia or anywhere else. Please feel free to share with us um, where you are this evening. And we're going to get started at about 7.05, and we're so happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us this evening. We're going to get started in about two minutes. And in the meantime, if you'd like to let us know where you're joining us from tonight, we'd love to welcome you. And we're going to uh, start at 7.05. So we'll get started shortly. Thank you. All right, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I just put in the chat the website, um, which includes a lot of exhibits that we have here at the Free Library, including none other than Medieval Life, which is the inspiration for tonight's program. We are joined this evening by Dot Porter, who is the curator of this exhibit. And actually behind her, you can see the exhibit as it's installed. Due to COVID, we are able to offer 
the exhibit uh, experience online in a truncated version. And the website that you'll go to is freelibrary.org backslash exhibitions. And we have Dot's cat joining us as well. And we're also really excited to welcome Lori Jones, who's joining us by way of University of Ottawa. And the two of them are going to be presenting today about uh, pandemics then and now. So I'll hand it off to Dot. But in the meantime, I just want to, again, welcome everyone and also um, encourage you all to chat it up in our chat. Um, feel free to drop questions, um, ideas, reflections, and we will get to those comments as soon as possible. Um, and we're definitely going to be saving time at the end for Q&A. Thanks again and take it away, Dot. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few slides to start before I turn it over to Lori. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's see, to PowerPoint, if I, if I then start the show, will it still read it? Can you see this? All right. So um, thank you, Susanna. Thank you for, um, for organizing this uh, session tonight. Um, and for inviting me to curate this exhibition. Um, so Medieval Life is um, an exhibition that is designed to look at medieval Europe through the eyes of manuscripts. And what I wanted to do with this exhibition was um, give us a way to look at the Middle Ages and then look at ourselves. And instead of looking and seeing how strange and different people in the Middle Ages were, I wanted to say how we have some similarities. Um, although I think after we, we can talk about this after Lori has spoken and after I have um, done the, the next part of my talk, we can see how, <laughs> how sort of interesting that differences, the compare and contrast is. Um, so the, the um, exhibition is organized into five different sections, um, family, labor, law and justice, religion and the natural world. And most of what we're gonna be talking about tonight has to do with material um, in the natural world section, um, although it will overlap with some of the others as well. Medieval life comes out of a, another project, which is called Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis. We call it Bibliophily for short. Bibliophily was a three year grant funded project organized uh, by the uh, Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries. And it was designed to digitize and make available online. Um, we wanted to get all of the medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia. And I think we got most of them. Um, there were 475 manuscripts that were digitized as part of the project from institutions around Philadelphia and also outside of Philadelphia. Uh, and we'll be looking at just a few of those uh, tonight. The, um, the websites, I think that uh, Susanna has a couple of websites that she can drop in the chat if you want to find out more about uh, bibliophily. And then I just have a couple of, of photos. So you can see I'm not actually in the gallery. I'm at my house, but Zoom has this great little background thing. So the cat is not in the gallery. I'm not in the gallery, but the exhibition looks amazing. It's actually been installed. We're just waiting for the, for the building to open. So here are a couple of shots of what it looks like. And I do hope that it will open and that when it does, um, some of you will be able to come to see it. Uh, as Susanna mentioned, there is an online exhibition as well though. So if you wanna get a taste of it, uh, you can go see it online. And that's all from me right now. So I'm going to turn it over to Lori to do her part of the talk. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Um... Dot and Susanna. I'm really pleased to be here and, and thanks very much to Susanna and to Dot both for inviting me to participate And this. It's uh, quite exciting. What I'm going to do, uh, let me just throw up my PowerPoint here. Okay. A new disease with no known cure, lockdowns, social distancing, masks, empty streets, and mass graves. All of these are things that to us in 2020 were previously outside our realm of experience. Naturally, we feel we're in uncharted territory. 
Yet our experience with COVID-19 is not entirely novel. Until the discovery of antibiotics and more recently antivirals, the need to take active measures to protect oneself from infectious diseases was the norm. In the same way, the upheaval that accompanied med medieval epidemics of plague also appeared to be uncharted territory for our mid 14th century predecessors. As historians know, the Black Death was not the world's first experience with pandemic plague. But for medieval Europeans, any connection to a pandemic some eight centuries earlier had long faded away. So when the Black Death manifested itself, it must have seemed to so many people that the world was surely ending. This evening, I'm going to talk in fairly general terms about the lived experience of plague for medieval Europeans. I'm going to focus primarily on the medical aspects of that experience and we'll use some materials from the Free Library and its partner institutions in Philadelphia to demonstrate medical beliefs and practices of the time. As we'll see, although medieval societies understood and rationalized the world in ways that are quite different from our own practices, in other ways their experiences might seem incredibly familiar to us today. I'm gonna start with a very quick overview of the Black Death. My slides don't want to, oh, there we go. Um, no, sort of the wider second pandemic. And then I'll move into a discussion of medical and public reactions to it. The traditional historiography of the Black Death has focused on Western Europe beginning with the Mongol army throwing its dead over the besieged walls of Kaffa in 1346 or 47. Genoese traders infected by Mongol corpses fled by ship and carried plague with them in the bodies of rats and their fleas, thereby sparking a tidal wave of death across Europe in 1348 and 1350. Thereafter, plague appeared every decade or so for three and a half centuries constantly reintroduced from a plaguey Eastern Mediterranean controlled by the Ottomans. The plague finally came to a close after the last great outbreaks of London in 1665 and Marseille in 1722. This long standing narrative has now been dismantled thanks to the combined and collaborative work of scientists and historians such as Monica Green and Carmichael, Hannah Barker, Nuket Varlik, Nayan Fancy, and Gerard Chouin, among many others. They've all slowly been composing a very different story. As this new map suggests, the strain of plague that caused the Black Death in Europe emerged, emerged in Central Asia in the 13th century, along with three other strains that did not reach Europe. The Mongols did play a significant role in moving that strain of plague across Central Asia and the Middle East and into the Black Sea region, but there were no dead bodies thrown over Kaffa's walls. Instead, plague traveled with grain and stowaway rodents, shipped into cities such as Baghdad once sieges were lifted, and then from the Russian steppes through Kaffa and into Europe. The plague bacterium then seems to have established itself within wild rodent colonies and their predators, along with other animals, reigniting outbreaks with some regularity for centuries that spread both within Europe and into the Eastern Mediterranean, not just the other way around. New archeological research is also showing that plague reached Sub-Saharan Africa, where both important trading centers and entire societies in the East and West suffered major declines in the late Middle Ages. The second pandemic did not end with the plague of Marseille in 1722. It continued in Southern and Eastern Europe and in, Rus in the Russian and Ottoman empires well into the 18th and even the 19th centuries. Our traditional narrative focused on Western Europe's experience is no longer viable or sufficient or even very helpful for understanding the wider context and human experience of the second plague pandemic. So let's turn to medical and public health responses to the Black, and Black Death and subsequent outbreaks of plague. It's important to recognize that medical, astrological and religious approaches to explaining and addressing plague were not completely distinct in the mid 14th century or later for that matter. 
because secular medicine operated alongside and in conjunction with both religious healing and astrology. And so explanations of what caused plague could, without any dissidence at all, range from malevolent, plan, excuse me, malevolent planetary conjunctions that polluted air high in the atmosphere to earthquakes that allowed venomous air to escape from deep in the earth. Other explanations included stagnant water and unburied corpses, God's wrath, contagion spread through eyesight, wicked actions caused by evildoers, and so on. All of these explanations were accepted and acceptable in a world in which medicine and understanding of disease was based on an understanding of how the body worked that was in many ways quite different from today. It was predicated on ideas of humors, miasma, and astrology that had been inherited from the Greeks, especially from Hippocrates and Galen, then through the lens of Muslim writers whose books were in turn translated into Latin and disseminated it through Europe. Contemporary medical theory considered the body and the soul to be inextricable. Righteous living, prayer, and repentance were not only benefited the soul, but also offered protection against earthly disease. Illness and suffering, especially in the form of epidemics, was divine punishment for sin. Some people also believed that certain diseases were caused by an undefined external entity that was carried in or transmitted through corrupted air that entered the bodies of susceptible people. And of course, the most susceptible were those who already had unbalanced humors or who were sinful. Humoral theory was based on the idea that each person's body contained a unique blend of four humors or liquids being blood, black bile, yellow bile, and mucus or phlegm. When each humor was properly balanced in a person's body, that person was healthy. When the body's waste disposal was inadequate or when one of the humors became corrupted, the person's body became imbalanced and illness followed. A healthy person thus enjoyed balanced humors and avoided the conditions that caused illness. He or she lived moderately and enjoyed conditions, or sorry, and enjoyed mental, physical, and spiritual equilibrium. In humoral medicine, diagnosing illness was done by examining a person's complexion, their pulse, their urine, their feces, and looking for something that was unbalanced. When urine, for example, with urine, for example, physicians examined its color, its murkiness, whether things were floating in it, in it, whether there was blood in it. Urine analysis was such an important tool that the flask was the visual symbol of a doctor, much like the stethoscope is today. The image on the left-hand side of the screen comes from a folded almanac in the Free Library of Philadelphia it depicts 20 flasks, flasks of urine and descriptions of what their different colors mean. The colors of a person's urine can range from almost clear to yellow and red, to dark green or purple, and even to black. The healthiest people's urine was a yellowish red color, since that meant their digestive system was working properly. This color, the colors in this image are, they seem to have faded a little bit, or at least on the the version of the image that I have. But if you look at the 11 o'clock position on the urine wheel, that's about where the right colored urine would be. Although diagnosis sometimes included listening to patients' explanations of their symptoms, physical examinations of the kind that we're familiar with did not take place. Internal balance was what mattered. Treatment relied largely on rebalancing a person's sick humors or a sick person's humor, sorry, by siphoning off the humor that had grown too strong or that had become corrupted. This was typically done with purgatives to induce vomiting, laxatives to induce bowel movements or by bloodletting. Phlebotomy or bloodletting was in fact a widespread almost cure-all treatment and preventative therapy. As a curative measure, phlebotomy was done to remove accumulated poison or corruption from a person's body. As a preventative measure, it ensured a healthy humoral balance that protected against disease. The image on the left comes from the same folded almanac as the urine will and shows the major veins suitable for bloodletting and what complaints bleeding could treat. 
In fact, each vein in the person's body was associated with a specific illness or condition and was opened as appropriate. Of course, herbal remedies were popular medical treatments as were prayers and other types of religious penance. The idea of the six non-naturals was just as important. These were the external factors that affected health and managing them appropriately meant not overindulging in food or drink, getting enough sleep and awake time, exercising moderately, using toilet facilities as needed, controlling one's passions and emotions, and ensuring that your, the nearby air and environments were clean. Sounds a lot like our modern advice, doesn't it? Astronomy and astrology underpin all of these diagnoses and treatments. Since the universe acted as an integrated system, planetary conjunctions had the power to influence person, people's health. Some medical practitioners offered astrological predictions along with remedial therapies and all good physicians took astral influences into account when making diagnoses and pre prescribing treatments. They construct, consulted astronomical charts and diagrams like the one in this image on the left from a 13th century manuscript at the College of Physicians in Philadelphia. They also relied on zodiac diagrams to determine which astrological sign was affecting which part of the human body. As you can see in the right-hand image from a Kislak Center manuscript, pictures of zodiac signs and sometimes the names of those signs are noted beside the parts of the body that they were believed to influence. I mentioned miasma earlier. Miasma was a poisoned or unhealthy air that emerged from bad smells, such as those emanating from swamps, stagnant bodies of water, enclosed spaces, dung heaps, and dead or decaying bodies. It could arise in one place and be carried through the wind elsewhere. Based on their geography and topography, some places were thought to be un unhealthier than other places, and their inhabitants perceived to be unhealthier than people living in more salubrious locations. Hippocrates had actually used this idea to suggest that Europeans were healthier than Asians, and these ideas really carried forward throughout the Middle, uh, the middle Ages and into the early modern era. Hippocrates' ideas were later expanded to suggest that people in Northern Europe were healthier than those in the South because they had to adapt to harsher conditions and this made them more hardy. Although they were sometimes the subject of intense debate, all of the ideas and therapies that I've mentioned continued to be used well into the late 1800s. It's fair to say that plague challenged the very foundations of late medieval knowledge. It presented highly distinctive yet unfamiliar, unfamiliar bodily symptoms and its catastrophic mortality levels overwhelmed all attempts to bring it under control. Even so, most contemporary medical writers were unwilling to state openly that they were facing a phenomenon that ancient authorities had not already described and that could not therefore be treated, sorry, explained, treated, and even cured through traditional medical, religious, and astrological means. And this meant that diagnostic, diagnostic and therapeutic practices actually changed very little. Medieval physicians did face bitter and often satirical commentary about their apparent inability, and hence that of traditional medical theory and practice to halt the plague epidemic. Physicians were mocked as ignorant at best, greedy at worst. Some people blamed them for refusing to treat the ill or for fleeing from outbreaks. Yet the Black Death also gave rise to a new genre of medical literature called the Plague Treatise, some examples of which you can see here. Through these texts, physicians offered their ideas about what was causing plague, their advice for preventing it through personal and environmental maintenance, and their recommendations for treating and curing it. Many agreed that an astrological conjunction that had aligned Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars in Aquarius at 1 p.m. on the 20th of March, 1345 was to blame since it corrupted and poisoned the air. Preventative measures were complex and aimed at identifying places that were or that could be protected from this infected air, at keeping the body resistant to infection and at avoiding contact with infected people. 
Again, some of this likely sounds familiar to today's advice of protecting ourselves from COVID-19. What did this advice mean in practical terms? The plague treatises recommended keeping windows closed or blocked to air coming from the south, since air from the south was the most dangerous. They advised burning sweet smelling herbs and tree branches to purify the air. They also advised avoiding crowds and keeping one's face turned away from the face of others. They argued against heavy exercise, hot baths, or too much sex, since these activities heated the body and opened its pores, thereby allowing infected poisonous air to enter the body. They also offered lists of foods and beverages that should be avoided, especially things like garlic, onions, and leeks, fruit unless sour, and anything with honey. By contrast, many writers heartily recommended using vinegar and watered down wine. Further preventatives included carrying aromatics under the nose to counter the foul air and ingesting a small amount of a very special medicinal compound every day. Some writers made important distinctions between food and aromatics suitable for cold versus hot weather or for rich versus poor people. As for other conditions, phlebotomy served both preventative and curative purposes. For those actually stricken with plague, the treatises almost universally offer detailed instructions for determining which vein to bleed according to where the bubo had erupted. My own research has uncovered a very small number of these treatises in the 15th century that included adapted phlebotomy man images to specifically and solely address the plague. The rare diagrams you can see on the slides now show how bubbles in the armpit required bleeding from the cardiac vein in the arm, for example, or that bubbles in the groin are linked to the vein between the big and second toes. Many physicians also recommended lancing the bubbles. There was some sense that if the bubble matured to the point that it could be opened and the poison accumulated inside could be removed, then the patient was more likely to survive. Some physicians even recorded lancing their own bubos, claiming that this practice had saved their lives. The treatise writers likewise offered a multitude of recipes for plasters, powders, electuaries, conserves, and other, for other external and internal signs of the disease. Many similar recipes circulated independently, as we can see in this early 16th century German manuscript from the Kislak Center, or this slightly later one from Italy. If you've read about plague treatments already, most likely you know of those that seem especially bizarre when compared to modern medicine, such as, for example, putting dung on plague buboes, or perhaps a live chicken treatment, whereby feathers are plucked from around a rooster's anus and then the rooster's backside is placed on top of the bubo, presumably tied to the plague victim's body. The idea behind such cures and many similar efforts was that because of their inherent nature, the dung or the live chicken was able to extract or draw out poison from the bubo. This might seem strange to us, but when we put these treatments in the context of medical thinking at the time, they did make perfect sense. I'm sure it would not be too difficult to imagine how some of our current popular fad therapies today might look to people in the future when they look back with their own ideas of how human bodies work and interact with the wider world. What about society-wide efforts to manage plague in medieval times? There's been much research in recent years into administrative responses to the plague including efforts to clean the streets, to improve garbage collection, to move foul smelling industries such as tanning and butchery outside the city walls, to lock potentially infected people inside their homes and to utilize mass graves. Some of the local actions that we typically associate with the Black Death actually came a little bit later during subsequent waves of the pandemic. The first quarantine legislation was acted in Dubrovnik in 1377 that same city instituted the first permanent health office in 1390. Founded in 1423, Venice's old Lazaretto was the first permanent plague hospital in the world. Around the same time, the Venetians also started to employ Pizzi Gamorti 
or people whose job it was to clear the streets of bodies and to commit the souls of the dead to God. Their main jobs were to transport plague corpses by boat to special burial islands, to transport the sick and their goods to plague hospitals, to clean infected goods, and to clean and fumigate infected houses. Who were these Pisa, Pisa Gomorti in the sense they were the essential workers of plague infected medieval Venice? Usually they were criminals. In Dubrovnik, similar work was undertaken by poor people who had been infected, but who had survived the plague. In both places, these workers were feared, shunned, abused, and otherwise set apart from society, blamed as they inevitably were for actually spreading the disease. They did not, however, face the terrible levels of violence wrought upon some groups of people like Jews, who during the Black Death were charged and executed en masse in many regions of France, Germany, and Spain. What about our famous plague doctor? In spite of what your books or the internet might tell you, he definitely did not exist during the Black Death. He may have existed in a few places in France or Italy during the 17th and 18th centuries, but other than a small number of contemporary drawings and descriptions, which often were satirical in nature, there is actually very little real evidence of him. He has become an iconic image of the Black Death, but like so many other images that you find on the internet purporting to show medieval plague, he has been mislabeled and misused. As a closing comment, I'd like to reflect for a moment on this very interesting manuscript in the Kislak collection that I plan to study in more detail. These are the memoirs of Francois de Marle, a Frenchman from Provence who had studied in Avion and Pavia in the late 15th century. The memoirs cover the years when he was between the ages of about 16 and 56. What is most striking are his accounts of experiencing the plague, the horror, the scenes of death, the fear all come through, but so too does faith in medicine and hope for the future. Putting ourselves in his shoes can help us to better understand how medieval people experienced the second plague pandemic and hopefully to better understand our own pandemic today. Thank you. Thank you. I think, thanks. <laughs> Hi, that was great. That was, that was really good. And, uh, and I think that it, this fault, what I'm going to say follows up um, pretty well in what, what Lori just said. So um, I'm, I'm the curator and I know manuscripts. So what I'm going to do is look a little bit more closely at uh, actually some of the manuscripts that Lori mentioned and, and a couple of other things too. So let me share my scoop. Oh no. Hold on. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. And okay, so we're back here. So one of the um, sections of the exhibition that I mentioned is the natural world. And um, obviously, the medical uh, history is, is included in that, although the exhibition itself doesn't have um, much medicine in it. Um, it does, however, have astronomy and astrology, so there will be a little bit of that there, as you can guess. So um, we've already seen this uh, in, um, in Laurie's uh, presentation. This is a, an image of St. Roch or Roche, I suppose, from um, Lewis E. 112, which is a manuscript in um, the Free Library of Philadelphia. And the book that it's in is, is called A Book of Hours. A Book of Hours is a type of prayer book, um, a personal prayer book that a person would have, um, they might care, even carry it with them, um, and they would pray in it throughout the day. That's why it's called a book of hours, because there are prayers that you might say at, at different hours. They're based uh, on the type of uh, daily prayers that monks and nuns do, but they were designed, it sort of evolved over time. Books of hours were designed for people who were not monks or nuns or priests, just everyday people, um, 
working class or um, sorry, uh, middle class people who had money or um, people who were uh, royalty in the courts. So there were really nice books of ours and there were not so nice books of ours. But my point is that it's a religious, it's a religious book. And so you would expect to have uh, images of saints in them. Um, and then this is another manuscript that, uh, that Laurie showed us. This is LJS uh, 463. It's a medical and astrological miscellany. And a miscellany is another type of manuscript uh, that is fairly common. A miscellany, as you can probably guess, it just means it's a book that has a lot of different texts in there. And if it's a medical and astrological miscellany, it means that most of the texts in there are going to be medical or uh, astrological. So these are the topics, the general topics there. Um, and here is our, our doctor with a flask of urine who we've already seen. Um, so you might not really think that these two books would have anything in common, but they actually do. And that's the third of third, the third line. Hello. There we go. They both have calendars in them. Um, so you probably have calendars. You, you might have an app on your phone or a paper calendar hanging on the wall um, that you use to track the days. And if you have to take the cat to the vet, you probably write it on your calendar if you have meetings, work meetings. Um, in the Middle Ages, calendars were quite different. So they do um, give you the days. So it's every day of the year, but it's really designed as a map of the church year. So the months are divided into sections. Um, and I don't, you can, if you look at the two examples here, the one on the left is from the miscellany. The one on the right is from the book of hours. Um, and they look very similar in design. So you have the KL at the top, which is calends, which is where we get our word calendar. Um, this is for January, so it'll say January at the top. And then you have these columns, um, and that's where you figure out the, like you've heard of the Beware the Ides of March. Uh, this is ancient Rome, uh, the Ides of March is the 15th of March, that's the day that Julius Caesar was killed. Um, so the, the, the months were organized quite differently. You wouldn't say the first, second, third, you'd say the calends or the Ides or the other, the other day. So you use the, the um, columns to sort of figure out what day it is. And then the wider column to the far right gives us saints days and church days. So um, the first of January, the one at the very top is the celebration of the circumcision of Christ. Um, and both of these calendars have that um, because that was a very important day for the church year. Um, the 6th of January is the Epiphany. It's in red in both of these. If you go down, uh, if you count down six, there's the Epiphany. And that's another very big celebration. One of the ways that we can um, use calendars is to figure out where manuscripts were written um, because different locations celebrate different saints. There are different saints who were celebrated in England than who were celebrated in France. And even within France, there would be different saints in the south of France and in the north of France. So you can look and see which saints are listed in a calendar. Um, and you, it can sort of help you figure out where a um, manuscript is from. Usually we do this with books of hours, but in this case, we have a medical and astrological miscellany that also has a calendar with the saints days um, because it was such a, an important organizational um, thing for for everybody so even in what we would we might think of it as secular but they did not they didn't think about it that way it was all it was all mixed together um so the calendars let's see and then we're just going to go and oh yes this is the other thing so the calendar on the left has a little image on the bottom um it's a zodiac um Zodi um, or you know a zodiac sign. It's um, the water carrier Aquarius there, and so you might say, well, that makes sense because it's an astrological manuscript. So, okay, so it has a a, a zodiac illustration. The calendar on the right is a religious book, so it doesn't have zodiac. 
but a lot of books of ours did have um, did have zodiac signs in them. So here are four leaves um, from uh, the what was the hours of Louis the Twelfth uh, from around 1500. So this was a very uh, fancy manuscript that was um, at some point broken up, and four broken up means it was taken apart. So the leaves were distributed. Four of the leaves are at the Free Library of Philadelphia. And if you look at, at, the, at them, at the par part portion, the top portion of those illustrations that are blue and gold, those are zodiac signs. So the zodiac was, was a part of the calendar a lot of times. Um, and then the images at the bottom are labors of the month, which we talk about in the labor section of the exhibition, uh, but not so much here. But this is just to sort of, what I'm, what I'm doing is sort of bringing out more about this interplay of the medicine and religion and astrology. And in the middle medieval mind, they didn't make the kinds of separations that we do. And that's shown in the texts. So I'm gonna go back to LJS uh, 463 um, and just look at all of the texts that, that make up this miscellany and see the different, the different types of texts that are here. So it starts out, the first text here, after the calendar, is the treatise on the signs of the zodiac. Um, and here is the ram representing Aries. And the text here um, is talking about here is what it, it means to be, um, to be in the you know, sign of Aries or to be born in the sign of Aries. Um, and, and there are sections for each of the signs of the zodiac um, in this section. The next text is a treatise on the planets and their children. So um, medieval people knew about the planets. Um, they knew the sun and the moon and they knew the planets. Um, so they start with Saturn. Saturn is here and the planet is associated in different ways with the zodiac signs, right? The, over the year, the planets actually move through the signs. And so here we have Saturn with Capricorn and Aquarius. So we're still sort of very solidly in this astrological uh, section. So we go through all um, through the planets. The planets actually include the sun and the moon there. Um, the next section is treatise on the skies. And this is actually uh, interesting. So here are uh, two men making uh, astronomical observations. So there's one, he's actually looking at the sky. Um, and you can see the sun and, or I suppose that's the moon and a couple of stars. And then the other one has a book where maybe he's making notes or he's looking up information based on the information that his friend is giving to him. Um, and that, so now we're looking, we're actually looking at the sky. So they weren't just looking at the books, they were actually looking at the sky itself. Oh no, I have to plug my computer in. I don't wanna die. All right. Um, so the next section, I'm glad that Lori talked so much about the humors. Um, so I'll just sort of show this to you. So there is actually a whole section in this, uh, in this book uh, about the, the humors, which it calls the four complexions or the temperaments. Um, and so we have sanguine um, that is being active and social, which as Lori said is associated with blood. Um, phlegmatic is the second one, the sort of apathy. Uh, which is associated with phlegm or mucus. Um, the choleric uh, temperament, uh, which is aggressive, is associated with the uh, yellow bile. And then melancholic or being depressed, we have the people sort of sitting sadly at the table down at the bottom, um, that's associated with black bile. And as Laurie said, uh, in order to be healthy, your four humors had to be balanced out or you would get depressed or you'd be angry all the time. Um, and so it's important to have the four humors uh, in the correct balance. And so that's what this section of the book is about. Uh, the next section is, is actual instructions for, okay, so now you, you, there's a problem with the humors. Well, what can you do about it? Um, instructions on physical things that you can do. Um, and so here again, we have that, um, the illustration that we've already seen of the bloodletting. Um, and then the, if you, in case you don't know how to bathe, here's a little, you know, nice looking tub with a couple of people bathing in it. Um, urine, so um, Lori talked about uh, urinalysis a little bit. And this is, um, something that, that there's actually a section in the exhibition on the urine wheel that we saw. So there he is again. Um, and the reason that we 
exhibition is because I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things I want to do uh, with the exhibition is sort of bring the Middle Ages closer a little bit. Um, and in everything that also we've been talking about, about the Zodiac and, um, and the bloodletting, uh, that's all a little, it's easy to say, well, that's very strange, but urine is actually something that they got right to some extent. So if you were sick, you would go to the doctor and he might examine your urine and tell you that you're sick. And of course, um, this is something that we do today. If you go to the doctor, they might have you pee in a cup, uh, dip in a stick, we can get a color uh, the, to, tell, you know, to tell you what's going on, or they might send it off to a lab and do more things. So they knew that the urine in some way was a key to health. Um, so the, the humor is not so much, but, but urine, yes. And so um, we've already seen the, the wheel here. So they would look at the wheel and they wouldn't only look at, at the color, but they might also smell it and even, um, even taste it to, to give them some idea of, of what might be going on. Of course, we don't do that uh, today, but they knew that those were things that could tell them something. Um, this is just another, I found this image in another one of the manuscripts we have at Penn, uh, LJS 449, which is another medical and astronomical miscellany, also from Germany, also from the 15th century. So quite similar in some ways to, um, to the other one. Uh, instead of being organized in a wheel though, this one is, you, ha you have the little um, flasks are, are sort of paired off. And so it's just a different organization to the same uh, information. Um, I was very pleased to be able to get a replica of a uroscopy flask, so, which you can sort of see in the photo here. And there's also a plastic, you can sort of see it off to the side, there is a plastic um, modern um, flask uh, as well. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about the, the uroscopy flasks is they are, they're rounded on the bottom, so you have to lay them on their side. And you can see that too in the illustration from the book, um, that they're rounded on the bottom. The urine wheel is from this manuscript, and I want to just take a minute to look at it because it's it's a really interesting uh, manuscript. It's from the Rosenbach Library, 14th century English manuscript, and it's called a belt book. And it's called a belt book uh, because it's a little hard to see, but but there there is some fabric up at the top here. The belt the the book would actually be attached to the doctor's belt, and so he could carry it around with him. And then if he went to your house. To, um, to check you out, then he would have the book available there. When we were starting uh, the Bibliophily project, I went with um, Will Knoll, who was the former director of special collections at Penn. We went to the Rosenbach to look at it and I happened to have my phone with me. And so here's Will, you can see the size of the book. It's quite small, so easy to carry around, but you can fold it out and it actually folds out to, to be pretty legible. The, the, the writing is quite small, but, and then he's gonna unfold it the rest of the way, but it folds out to, to quite sizable. So you can actually store a lot of information in quite a small space. It's not quite as good as having a USB stick, but it's kind of a, a medieval version of a USB stick. It's something very small that you can fit a lot of information in. You just fold it up and put it away. And you might recognize that that illustration on the bottom page, uh, because that is the, the phlebotomy man uh, that Lori was showing us earlier. So that's what he looks like in, in the book itself when he's not all, all flattened out. So the last thing I want to talk, well, second to the last thing, I do have a, one more thing after this, um, is Bald's Leech Book. So this is not a manuscript from Philadelphia. This is a manuscript from the British Library. It is a mid 10th century um, collection of medical recipes. And it's called Leech, Leech Book um, for the opposite way you're probably thinking. So the, the Old English word um, for physician was leche. And that's where we get the word for leech. So, you know, when Lori said that that there's this very close correlation between, you know, medicine and sort of bloodletting being um, the sort of go-to, that's that goes way back, and it goes so far back that our word for leech comes from the Old English word 
uh, and when I, when I say Old English, I'm talking uh, ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth century, so very early, way before Chaucer uh, or Shakespeare. So the reason that I want to talk a little bit about Bald's Leech Book is because there's a recipe in this manuscript. It's actually right there uh, for an eye salve, and there has been a group of microbiologists um, coordinating with people who study Old English at Nottingham University, um, the Center for Biomolecular Sciences. And they actually made the, um, they made the isolve and they, fo they followed the recipe and they did tests. And it was found to kill um, the, I can't, the M MRSA, the MRSA, um, uh, bacteria, which is antibiotic resistant. It's hard to make antibiotics because it's become resistant to all the antibiotics. And they actually made this and found that it was able to do it. So what, what is the recipe? Um, so it's a mixture of garlic, onions, wine, bovine bile salts. You brew them together in a brass cauldron and let it sit for nine days. And they found that this, um, is actually really uh, effective, and uh, which is interesting because because it shows you that that you know they they knew what they were doing. It I don't know how they figured it out. They being you know the people who came up with the recipes in Bald's Leech book, um, it really it really worked, um, and I thought this was really interesting too. I won't read I won't read all of it, um, but but they're they're looking at a very particular. Um, uh, thing that it was able to work against. And they say at the end there, the presence of garlic um, has no activity against biofilms. So garlic by itself, but if you take the garlic out, then it doesn't work. So they found that it, it was this particular mixture that, that, um, that, really made it, that really made it work, which is fascinating. Um, you know, it must have taken a lot of work to, to sort of figure figure that out. Um, and it's wonderful that they did and now we are able to, to, make, it, to make it now and make it work against um, diseases that we're fighting. Um, so I'll close by just showing a few more manuscripts. Lori also, um, Lori also showed these. So the, the recipe for um, the iSolve is sort of one big example, um, but there are a lot of, of recipe manuscripts, medical recipes. Um, that have, you know, potential, I don't know how much potential, but that haven't been, haven't been studied as much. And we have several of these um, in, in Philadelphia uh, and at Penn. So here's one, um, LJS 458, which is at Penn. And this has 400 recipes, including cures for the plague, um, epilepsy, and leprosy. And Laurie showed the same page. There's a plague, a plague recipe right here. Um, and this is a, another one that Laurie showed uh, that has um, among, and this is another miscellany. This manuscript actually has speeches and also has medicinal uh, recipes, um, including the plague recipe. And this is the memoir, again, the, the manuscript that Laurie closed with that, that's interesting because the other manuscripts are, um, are recipes like here's, here are things that you can make that will help fight the plague. And then this is about a person who was living it, the lived life. And I think that's really interesting to think about the lives that the people that led who created the recipes and who the doctors who had the belt book and went from house to house and were trying to help people get better. So I'm gonna skip. So if, I think to close and maybe to start to start our Q&A and our conversation. Um, you know, we've just spent the last hour or so looking back in time and trying to piece together from the information that we have, how people in the Middle Ages lived their lives, what kind of things they came up with in terms of um, taking care of themselves in times of plague, um, and how will our story be told in the future? in 50 years and 100 years and even further back and people look back at us, what are they going to think about um, about what, what we're doing? So thank you. I'll just stop my, stop my screen.
Thank you so much to both of our presenters for joining us this evening. We have a bit of time to um, address some of your questions. I know that we had a question earlier from Joe. I don't think we had a chance to answer it yet. Do images, illuminations, give us any information about the Black Death or bubonic plague not captured in the text? Would one of our presenters like to address that question if, if it hasn't been answered yet? Sure, I, I can can take a look at that. There's actually almost no artistic representations of plague before the late 14th century, or the, sorry, the late 15th century. So about 150 years after the Black Death is when people started drawing it. There are a few images that I'm aware of. Um, the one that I showed about the, uh, the coffins being carried. So there's a couple of images about coffins. Um, from the time of the Black Death, and there's a few images showing mass deaths of people, but everything you see, even into the 14th, the 15th century and the 16th century, is religious. Okay? The, the main point of the image is, to, is about the intercession of the saints, whether it's Saint Rock or Saint Sebastian or Mary or some other um, saints, and about looking for um, either getting thank thanking them for saving them from an epidemic or else asking them to protect them from an epidemic. Sometimes they showed um, for buboes, for example, or some other symptoms, but they really weren't meant to be medical images. They're meant to be religious images. It's really not until almost the 17th century that we start seeing what we would call plague art. I have nothing to add. <laughs> I have a question. So all of that, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, artwork that you see that is labeled as Black Death, and the chances are very high that it is not, that it's been mislabeled. I did a project on that a few years ago and, and have an article published in The Lancet. Um, about that very issue, about people mislabeling, mislabeling images from the medieval era that show sick people simply because they're sick and assuming that they're plague images and they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's the buboes that would that would show say that it's uh, that it's plague specifically. Yeah. 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 I have a question for Lori. Lori, could you tell us a little bit more about your work in general, the sorts of research that you're engaged with beyond the what you've covered for this talk and the collections that you work with? Sure. Um, so I, that project that I just mentioned, it was a little side project that I did looking at identifying mislabeled plague images. Um, most of my research to date has focused on one of two things, either plague treatises. Um, I had a slide with some images of those. I've studied probably about 250 of them from England and France and use them not so much to look at medical ideas, but more ideas about where the plague came from geographically and where the plague fit in people's idea of human history and how that changed over time and how it was different between England and France. And uh, my current uh, postdoctoral research is looking at a manuscript in the Wellcome Library in London that's from the late 16th century, um, contains medical texts that were first written in the 1400s and then printed in either the 1500s or the 16, early 1600s. And then this person at the end of the 1500s took these same texts and rewrote them, rewrote the contents. Of them and I'm, I'm unpacking sort of what are the original sources of these texts and why did this person change the meaning and the purpose of the text and what kind of changes did he make so it's it's really fascinating thank you so much for sharing that and dot could you tell us a little bit more about how you spend your days oh gosh let's see how do i spend my days um I have a project that we are in the process of um, sort of finishing up some software development. I'm not actually building the software, but I'm heavily involved in it, uh, that 
is, is mm -hmm. it involves um, creating models of manuscripts and then visualizing them in different ways. So we, I didn't really talk, I'm very interested in the physicality of manuscripts, which is one of the reasons that I showed you all the unfolding of the of the book. Um, but most of the books that I work with are codex, what we call codex manuscripts, which are books that are like books, like the books that you buy at the bookstore um, kind of books. And um, in the Middle Ages, they were pr primarily um, made, they might have been made by with parchment or paper later. Um, or if you were in the Middle East, the books would have been made from paper much earlier. But in any case, the generally what you do is you have sheets of I'll have some examples. You have sheets of parchment or paper and you lay them on top of each other and then fold them together to make little make a little booklet like this. And then you have you might have multiple booklets um, that you would put together and you sew them together and that makes your book. And part of the study of manuscript studies is looking at how books are put together um, both when they were originally made and also how they change over time, uh, because it's very likely that a manuscript sitting on a shelf right now is not the same as it was when it was made. Um, they get taken apart um, and then rebound. The the choirs might choirs being the little the little booklets they might get moved out of order. Um, new ones might be added, and so this is its whole other you know part of the study and it. Up until very recently, it, it, there's not a really easy way to study that. Um, partly because books can be hard; it can be hard to figure that out if you're looking at a book if it's we, what we call tightly bound. You can't actually tell. Um, and then, if even if you can see it, you need a way to describe it. So you might draw drawings. Um, there's a, a th thing that you see in a lot of catalogs. Um, that is, is called a collation formula, which basically says that things like choir one has this many uh, leaves and choir two has this many leaves, but it's, I've always found it hard to sort of make the connection between the physical thing and, the, and that formula. And so the project that we're working on builds software that you can use to sort of go through a manuscript and say, here's how many choirs, here's how many leaves each one has. And it can actually build a, a diagram for you. Um, and if you have, if the manuscript has been digitized, you can take the images and put them on that to sort of build you a model showing you how the book is put together. Um, and then once you have that, you can do historical, we have a, we're working with a graduate student right now who's interested in looking at a manuscript and sort of tracing the changes back um, so you get the full historical view, which is really fascinating. So that's what I, that's not all I do, but that's sort of big in my mind since the exhibition is uh, is pretty much done. I'm just waiting for it to open. So I also do social media. I think about manuscripts a lot. Beautiful, thank you, Dot. Thanks. And I'm noticing that um, Lori did have a chance to answer a little bit this question that was dropped in the chat, but I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Um, how can you tell what images slash illuminations are actually released to Black Death? And Lori, if you could talk a little bit about that, I would love that. So one of the, one of the problems that we've seen is that when you see an image on the internet or mm -hmm. even in a, a published book or tourist pamphlet or what have you, the image itself is often taken and cropped out of its original context. So all you're seeing is an image and you, you can make whatever interpretation that you want of it. But if you are able to look at that image in its original context and read the text, that surrounds the original image, then that will usually tell you what it's about. Um, so for example, in, I mean, I cropped the images for my presentation, but Dot was able to show you most of those images on the full page that they originally belonged to. And if you can read that text, then that will give you a really good idea of what's going on in that image. And I have to ask both of you, how do you read the text? It takes some learning. Um, I have learned through my research that um, 
13th and 14th century handwriting is beautiful. 16th century handwriting is horrible. And it, it's like the whole idea is that as people became more literate, they stopped writing nicely, right? Because they weren't, they're writing for themselves rather than reading, writing for somebody else. So yeah, the older the handwriting, the, the nicer it is. That's what I found. How about you, Dot? So, so my dirty secret is that I don't, I don't read. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit down and sort of read the text. I might be able to sort of work through it, but because of the work that I do, um, I'm, I'm really interested in the physical book. So if I look at a manuscript, I'm not really interested in what the text says because I have Lori. If I want to know what the text says, I'll go to Lori and I'll say, Lori, what does the text say? Um, but I can figure out, you know, I can look at a book and I can know what type of book it is. So I could look, I could look at um, LJS six, um, 463, which we looked at a lot. Um, if I didn't know it, I could tell you it was a 15th century German astronomical and medical miscellany just from looking at it. Um, I, Cause I recognize the handwriting and I recognize the type of book. Um, and I, I learned, you know, I know a little bit of Latin, so I could, but I don't have, you know, I don't have to, but it's, I just like looking, looking at them and figuring out the physical parts of them. So I guess I do read it. I read it kind of in a different way. I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at different kinds of information. Yeah. Con context clues come to mind, right? Yeah. I think we all employ in different ways. So I'd love if anyone else wants to share some questions. I also don't want to keep you too long, but um, yeah, I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. I also really want to encourage everyone while we're still on this call together to go and check out the other programs that we have related to this exhibit. Um, if you go to freelibrary.org, you'll see there's a virtual programming link that I shared that I can reshare. And then if you just search medieval life, you'll see a whole host of events that I've put together. And um, they go through the end of January 2021. And there are two additional programs that are still in the works that will be offered in January. And they're in partnership with a really wonderful blog called In the Middle. Um, and if another question comes up and I have a chance to pull up the link, I can do that. Um, but we're really looking forward to continuing to have conversations around these materials that are featured in the exhibit Medieval Life that um, really come from our collections and then other regional collections as well. So this is really a wonderful opportunity to share these materials with the world and then, you know, work with presenters, including folks as far away as where Lori is and one of our programs features someone over on the West Coast. Um, so that, you know, many of our presenters are still coming from the Philadelphia area, but we're able to kind of look for silver linings where there are some in terms of being able to do virtual programming. Yeah, that's good. So yeah. one of the, one of the, I know that there's one, there's going to be a make your own astrolabe, um, which is a medieval um, tool that was used to look at the stars. So if you want to look at the stars, like a medieval person did, um, you could do that. And there's going to be a cooking one, we have a friend who's going to be doing a, um, a recipe, and then you can also bake the recipe. And there's a music, music one. Um, and then the two with uh, in the middle. So that's going to be, that's really exciting. So the exhibition hasn't opened yet, but we're still doing stuff. So that's nice. Hi. You're muted. Oh, there you Sorry are. about that. Okay. I can just chime in and say when you go to the virtual programs link that I dropped, you can read the full descriptions and we'll be doing registration by Eventbrite as we did for this event and then doing our programs through the Zoom webinar. So um, you can read more about the details. I don't want to uh, miss any of our presenters. The, the cooking program has a couple of different presenters, including a duo that will be presenting different recipes using cloves, um, which 
as you can imagine, were very much of a global ingredient by the time of the Middle Ages. So um, if there aren't any further questions, I wanna join everyone in giving both of our presenters a huge amount of gratitude for coming on today and sharing all of your expertise and excitement around this amazing project and this amazing exhibit. And I really want to encourage everyone to go to freelibrary.org backslash exhibitions and check out the Middle Medieval Life exhibit online which is available for you now. Um, and please join us for our upcoming programs. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Okay.